pulling a rabbit from a hat. A trick that everybody knows and that hardly anyone actually performs. Who and when created it? Why did it become and why does it remain the synonym for magic? And what hidden meaning is there behind this illusion? My name is Alex Romanov, I'm a magician and a historian. Today I'm going to tell you the history and the real secret of pulling a rabbit from a hat trick. This episode is produced in partnership with The Vanishing Inc. Let's start! If I ask you to think of a logo for magic as a performing art, an image that would represent magic, I am pretty sure that pulling a rabbit from a hat certainly would be one of the first things that comes to your mind. Fair enough, pulling a rabbit from a hat is the symbol of magic. Stock photos, cartoons, business cards, bags, t-shirts, it is everywhere. And here is a paradox. Most people have never seen this trick, and most magicians have never performed it. And yet, for some reason, everybody associates it with magic. As a magician, I can say 9 out of 10 people would at some point in a conversation inevitably make a reference to a rabbit and the hat trick. Sometimes they just ask if I can do it, and sometimes they try to make a hilarious joke about it, which is never actually funny. But I still laugh because I'm a nice guy. So I asked myself, how did it happen? When did this trick, which you never see performed during magic conventions, which you never learn as an aspiring magician, which you never find in modern books and magic, become so popular? So let's go back in time and find the answers. In 1949, a magazine for magicians, Genie, published an article How to Produce a Rabbit from a Borrowed Hat by William W. Larson, co-founder of the Hollywood Magic Castle. At the end of the article, he wrote, Did you know how all this rabbits from a hat business began? It seems that in England, hundreds of years ago, a woman claimed that she was attacked by a monster rabbit and later gave birth to five cute baby bunnies. A magician of the time, quick to cash in on the publicity attendant the matter, advertised the birth of a rabbit from a borrowed hat and did quite handsomely buy it. Wait, what? This is actually a funny story. In 1729, a lady named Mary Toft gave birth to 12 rabbits, which was confirmed by her husband and by a doctor. This story went all the way up and even reached his majesty, King George I. Yet, after having been brought under proper investigation, Mary confessed to a fraud. So this part of the story really happened. But there is no evidence of any performers of the time who used it to attract public attention. So this part is only a legend. We do not know about any magicians pulling rabbits from hats until the 19th century. It is believed that this historical, world-changing event first happened only 85 years after the story of Mary Toft. In 1814, a popular French magician Louis Comte, also known as the King's Conjurer, pulled a rabbit from a hat during his show for the first time in history. Maybe even in front of the French king Louis XVIII. About 20 years later, in 1836, a book The Humorous Magician Unmasked was published. In this book, among other tricks such as to make a person disappear in a sack, we find the first detailed descriptions of the rabbit trick. The trick is called experiment number 36, to produce a live rabbit and a number of other articles from a gentleman hat. And it looked like this. A magician borrows a gentleman's hat and put it on his table. He then produces a live rabbit, a small dog, kitten, potatoes, a cabbage, apples, and a number of other vegetables and fruits, cannonballs of various sizes, also a wig, and anything else that will amuse. The secret of the trick is simple and practical. You need an assistant hidden in the table that will put all these amusing objects inside the hat.
either from this book or from Louis Comte, this trick was adopted by a magician, John Henry Anderson. John Henry Anderson came from Scotland and was known as the Great Wizard of the North and claimed that he was given this title by the famous Scottish writer Walter Scott. It was not true. In fact, a lot of what Anderson claimed was not true. But one thing we know for sure, Anderson used the rabbit trick in his repertoire in the late 1830s. And I have proof. Here, my dear friends, is the first picture in history of a magician pulling a rabbit from a hat. John Henry Anderson was famous for his incredible marketing. He even carried a printing press with him during his travels, so he could print flyers, posters and booklets on the go. So he definitely helped to popularize the trick. This illusion was soon copied by his colleagues. For example, by his rival, the Great Wizard of the South. And if it starts to sound like an epic fantasy film to you with all these wizards, it is okay, because 19th century magic was really epic. In 1876, Angela John Lewis, the leading writer on magic of the time, published a book Modern Magic under a pseudonym Professor Hoffman. In that book, the rabbit trick looked like this. A magician borrows a hat from a spectator, produces an egg from it, and then two live rabbits. Then one of the rabbits apparently swallows the other one, and to prove it, the performer draws special attention to the imaginary increased fatness of the remaining rabbit. The second rabbit then reappears alive and well. This book would become the main magic manual for a whole generation of magicians around the world, so it for sure promoted the rabbit trick among performers. In the late 19th century, many famous magicians performed this feat. But there was one magician who did something really special to popularize it. English conjurer David Devance became the first performer to be ever captured on film. And in this short film he produced rabbits from a hat, even though it was done using camera tricks. Devant also complained that sometimes he performed this trick at children parties and kids could steal rabbits from him, so he had to chase them around the house to get his rabbits back. Yeah, this doesn't sound like an epic fantasy film anymore. Alexander Herman, aka Herman the Great, had rabbits featured in his acts regularly. American superstar magician Howard Thurston later produced all out of a hat, including his pretty assistants and rabbits. Thurston was also generous enough to give rabbits as presents to his young spectators. With so many stars of magic performing this trick, it is no surprise that it soon became a cliché. In 1924, magician Carl Hertz, in his book A Modern Mystery Merchant, wrote Borrow a gentleman's silk hat and instead of producing a rabbit or a guinea pig therefrom, just try to throw in a pack of cards from a distance of two or three feet. You will provide the entertainment just the same, but as card after card falls anywhere but in the hat, you will discover that the audience provides the entertainment at your expense. So it is clear that in 1924 this trick was such a cliché that Hertz believed that doing this could be as entertaining as producing a rabbit. In 1926, Dr. Harlan Tarbell published his famous course in magic. It would become and still remains one of the most well-known sources of magic secrets. Tarbell described a bunch of rabbit tricks and it is even pictured on the cover of the first volume of the course. About this time, pulling your rabbits from a hat started to become a part of popular culture and being used as a metaphor for something magical. Here are some cool examples. In 1932, it was used for the advertisement of Electrolux vacuum cleaners. The celerity with which a conjurer produces a rabbit from a hat is no more wonderful than the ease and rapidity with which the Electrolux makes dust disappear. In 1940, for Carter Furware. 
how breathlessly we used to watch rabbits being brought out of an empty silk hat. But there is another magic no less entrancing because it is done quietly and simply, the undeniable magic of kata restyling. That's marketing at its best. In 1942, this trick was featured in a story about one of the most famous rabbits, Bugs Bunny. Uh, uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat. Regardez. People who created these ads and cartoons in 1930s and 1940s were in their 20s, 30s or 40s, so it is very probable that they had experienced magic shows as kids, and they had inevitably seen this trick performed by Thurston or Herman or Devant, so for them it was indeed the symbol of magic. But not for magicians, because ironically, starting from the 1930s, 1940s, there were fewer and fewer magicians who actually performed it. In 1955, in a magazine for magicians Abracadabra, the author wrote, Every layman likes a conjurer to be able to produce a rabbit from a hat. He then complained, It is a feat of which many magicians are shy, largely on account of the difficulty of loading the animal into the hat. And this is right, the trick got less and less practical. Top hats went out of fashion and rabbits got fatter. Well, not really, of course, but the top hats did go out of fashion, plus a lot of magicians were performing in nightclubs, not in theaters, or switched to close-up magic, so carrying a rabbit around was not convenient. Besides, doing tricks with the live animals became an ethical question. Does a rabbit really want to sit in a secret pocket for 15 minutes before it has to appear on a stage with hundreds of loud people around it? Well, I'm not sure, to be honest. In 1964, the article in another magazine for magicians, The Linking Ring, claimed I bet 99 out of every 100 magicians do not even use live rabbits in their act, let alone produce them from a hat. It was true, in the second half of the 20th century there was no star magician who used it as his trademark trick, like it was 50 years earlier. Today many magicians still do tricks with rabbits, but very few actually produce them from hats. Even in this video from The Insider dedicated to pulling a rabbit from a hat trick, which is actually a really nice video, they did not pull a real rabbit from a hat and instead showed the production of a fake rabbit and a rabbit vanish using a box. So now, when we know the history of the trick, let's get back to the really interesting question. Considering the fact that the trick is hardly ever performed today, what is the secret of its popularity in public imagination? First and foremost, as I already said, it was promoted by many famous magicians of the Golden Age of Magic, late 19th, early 20th century, and it was at that time that it entered popular culture. But why this trick in particular? There were many other cool tricks with elephants or birds or guinea pigs. Well, there are a couple of reasons. First, let us talk about the rabbit. Rabbits could be easily obtained in any town on any market, so it was just practical. If you were a traveling magician, you could get a rabbit right before your show. Rabbits can also sit quietly for long periods of time, unlike, for example, cats or dogs. Rabbits have white fur and it creates a nice contrast with a black hat and a suit. Plus, rabbits can appear bigger than they actually are. They are kind of squishy, like spongebobs. It is just a metaphor, never squish a rabbit like a spongebob. And of course, rabbits are very, 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 very cute. Very cute. 
Okay, now top hats. Uh, top hats were simply a standard element of a gentleman's outfit in the 19th and early 20th century, which was practical and important because very often a magician borrowed a hat from a spectator, which uh, made this trick much more impressive. But I must say that magicians did many different tricks with the rabbits that did not involve hats, and also many tricks with hats that did not involve rabbits. So for some reason it was not producing a rabbit from under a spectator's coat, or producing a cabbage from a top hat that became popular. It was the combination of these two particular elements that created a truly memorable image. So memorable that it is still relevant today. And there is a reason for this. It is a combination of something serious associated with culture, social status, good manners on the one hand, and on the other hand something completely opposite. A funny, cute little creature. It is this contrast that makes this trick funny, exciting and easy to remember. And most importantly, it is universal. It works for everyone. Imagine the most serious gentleman, a senator or a president, wearing a top hat. A magician borrows a hat. Everybody feels tension. What is he going to do? It is a respected gentleman and it is an expensive, high-quality top hat. Now, if you produce a cabbage, it would just be weird. But if you produce a rabbit, everybody will be laughing and smiling, the tension is released and there is an adorable rabbit in the room. So even the most serious gentleman would smile. And this is what magic essentially is about – taking serious, smart adults and allowing them to experience wonder just like kids. And pulling a rabbit from a hat is a perfect representation of this idea. There are some great modern acts with rabbits by such performers as Penn and Teller or Paul Daniels, and I highly recommend watching them. Yet all of them play on the same idea – pulling a rabbit from a hat is a stereotype and magicians rarely do it. So today this trick is a paradox – magicians do it only because they are supposed to. Will it remain the symbol of magic in the next 100 years? We do not know. Do something unexpected but ingeniously effective in response to a problem. This is what an idiom pulling a rabbit from a hat means. So one thing we can say for sure – even if soon rabbits retire from stage career completely and top hats will be only seen in museums, magicians will continue finding unexpected and ingeniously effective solutions to their main problem. How to make sure that spectators are astonished. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then don't forget to press the like button and subscribe and all these other buttons. By doing this, you will give me extra motivation to keep producing these videos. And also, you can always share this video with friends or with the magic club or community that you're part of. By doing this, you will also help promoting magic history, which I think is really important because. I believe that learning more about magic history can help us become better magicians, better performers, better human beings. My name is Alex Romanov, this was Art of Impossible, and I will see you next time.